It's fine. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me for another episode of the Typical Skeptic Podcast. I have an amazing, fascinating guest tonight, and I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. Um, we're going to hear a story tonight about a, a, a real near-death experience followed by a miracle. Um, and you don't hear too many stories like this. Um, I had heard this one on another podcast, and I just said, I have to talk to her. I have to hear more about her story. It's so interesting. I think you guys are really going to be enthralled. And I have with me Rosemary Thornton. She's an architectural historian and author. She enjoyed a successful career in marriage until the death of her husband and a bout of cancer, which resulted in an NDE. She is the author of Remembering the Light, How Dying Saved My Life. Um, you're going to hear a story that's uplifting, sad, mind-boggling, and and it's just, it's amazing. So I want to welcome her to the show. Her website, by the way, is www.temporarydeath.com. And I want to give a big, well, warm welcome to Rosemary Thornton. Uh, Rosemary, thank you for joining me. How are you? I'm fine. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Yeah, I I, uh, I really enjoyed your story. And I, I think you have an amazing book. And uh, it, it's a story I think that needs told. I think it'll give people more faith and like, if consciousness continues after death and me I, I i say this every podcast i i've been I experiment with out of body experiences to try to see if uh, i'm i'm really in like uh, kind of not, not obsessed but i'm really like into out of body experiences near death experiences because i think they're the ultimate proof for if consciousness continues after death what are your thoughts <laughs> that's a pretty big question I have no doubt consciousness continues even before my my own death experience. And I actually prefer to call it a temporary death experience. I've written uh, 10 books now. I've been a newspaper reporter. I've written for magazines. I've been an editor. I've spent 30 years in writing, actually 35. So near death is what happens if you're on an airplane and things go bad and you almost crash, but it's saved at the last minute. I have medical verification, as do many people who've had an end, uh, well, what we call an NDE, that my heart stopped and I was dead for more than 10 minutes. So that's pretty profound as to whether or not consciousness continues. I'd always been about 98 percent sure that it does. And after I had my own experience, I have no doubt. And there are there are people who will say, well, you know, it's the brain shutting down and the chemicals and the hormones and all that stuff. And that's not what happens. And the reason my story, I hope is so uh, compelling i think it offers some specific proof is because at the time of my death i had been diagnosed with stage two cancer in fact the oncologist uh, who examined me said it had advanced to a point where the flesh was distorted it was cervical cancer actually and when i came back every vestige of it was gone now that's nothing that can be explained by the brain releasing chemicals or hormones or whatever at the time of death and secondly i was changed at the time of my death, I had been experiencing profound, uh, inexplicable grief, grief that cannot be described by words from my husband's suicide 29 months earlier. And when I came back from this, uh, that grief, that deep grief was mostly healed. I mean, I, I still grieve his death, but I'm out of the the absolute unspeakable misery of what happened. How could he do this? My life is over. My life is ruined. It was a massive spiritual reset in fact shortly after my death uh well I, I after i died i ended up in the hospital for a few days but once i was back home i flipped open my bible it opened to psalm 23 and my eyes fell on the verse he restoreth my soul and i realized that was the healing the well i'm so very grateful that the stage two cancer was medically documented to be gone the bigger healing was the healing of my soul when somebody dies by suicide uh, there just aren't words to explain how that eviscerates a person from the coulda, woulda, shouldas to the regrets to the guilt on and on and on. Uh, I know so well, I'm in a social media group for suicide survivors, as we are known, those who have lost a husband or a wife to suicide. And uh, it can take you years to be to a point where you can function. And I'm not surprised now I understand better why sometimes people who suffer severe trauma end up being hermits because society doesn't know what to do to with us, what to say to us, any of it. So the real healing was the healing of my soul. And that that was very significant. You know, as a as an example, I had written a book. Uh, I had written actually nine books, but one of my books was on a topic about a ghost town in Virginia 
it took me six years to write that, that book, and I was very well versed on that book. A year after my husband's death, I was invited to do a podcast on that topic of this ghost town in Virginia, and I could not do it. I literally could not do it, and I ended up doing it, but I did a horrible job, and I kept saying, we have to stop this, and, and they ended up not publishing it because I, I made such a mess of it. So to go from that to this was pretty profound. And I had been a public speaker before my husband's suicide. So it was, uh, that's the, why the title of my book is Remembering the Light, How Dying Saved My Life. It was 29 months between his suicide and my own temporary death experience. And those were 29 very, very hard months where I experienced everything from being a societal leper to a brief time when I actually lived out of my car. And the only reason I didn't stay living out of my car was a family friend intervened and said, you're not doing that. And, you know, once a woman, I mean, I was 59 at the time. No, I was uh, 56 at the time of his death. When somebody ends up living out of their car, they've started a downward spiral and it has to be interrupted. And if it's not interrupted, things just get worse and worse. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to I'd ask you this because I think I, I, I study cancer, too. I, I It's one of the things that really like my dad died of cancer so i i know what it's like i mean honestly like it's a it's a plague it really is a plague on our society and i can't really tell you where it comes from but i i wanted to ask you this do you think the mind is so powerful that maybe your trauma from seeing your husband suicide you know triggered that cancer i mean i've heard of cancers being triggered from people being hurt so much like you know hurt emotionally so much that it causes a physical effect on the body do, do you think that's possible i know in my own case i had three prayers i prayed every night and one of them was god heal me or let me die and by heal me i meant heal my mental state. This was like those 29 months from his death to my diagnosis. My second prayer was spare me the life review. I, after his suicide, which was by gunshot, I had recurring nightmares that I, I got to him before he shot himself and watched it, or I got to him after he shot himself and saw it. So these nightmares plagued me and I begged God when I die, and I knew it wouldn't be long, spare me that and then my third prayer was because of his death there were many difficult legal decisions to be made at all which had significant consequences do you think we we uh we come to this earth to live life learn life lessons do you think this was like something you had to learn as a life lesson like um you hear this a lot of times that like i, I don't know a lot of times in alternative media we hear stories that people make soul contracts before they come to earth where they plan out their life beforehand and they know that these they're gonna encounter these things but then we get hit with a veil of forgetfulness so they you know everybody like say say we reincarnate here and then we keep reincarnating but we come Come to the earth to learn life lessons i mean what do you buy into that or what do you and do you i mean because a lot of the lessons it seems like especially in your case are hard you know if that what happened i'll pause it yeah i, I was like I, I hit record again it seems like we come to this earth to learn life lessons but those life lessons are really hard what do you, I mean, do you, do you buy into that, that we have maybe soul contracts before we come to earth and that these are all learning lessons like that we have to overcome? That's a big question. <clears throat> I suppose it's certainly possible. I, I have heard many people say that we sign up to learn big life lessons and sometimes we take on more than we can handle. I, I don't know. I I wish, if that's the case, I wish I had made a different choice because I considered this man to be the love of my life. And he was my second husband, and we were married 10 years, and we were unique, uniquely suited to each other. I very much enjoyed his company. My children loved him as a father figure. Uh, so I don't know. I, I guess it strikes me as pretty severe if I signed up for this. I, I kind of hope I didn't, frankly. I mean, I had had enough of a hard life. My father abandoned me when I was 14, wanted nothing to do with me, disappeared from my life. Uh, I got married at 18, had two babies by the time I was 21. And then uh, it's just, it has not been an easy life. And then I thought when I met and married my husband, I thought all that was behind me. I thought it would now be a sweet and easy life. And life's hardships are not doled out in equal measure. 
And so it is still challenging for me sometimes to look at other people's lives and think, how did they, how is it they met the love of their life in fifth grade and they stayed with them for decades? How, why could I not have that? And my life has been, um, it's been hard. And did I sign up for this? I don't know. Is my story a blessing to others? I really hope so. But the other thing is, and I know this is true, uh, it, I have met so many wonderful people who have been through traumas not unlike my own, and they have become my dearest friends. And we don't have relationships where we talk about the latest deal we got on new shoes or what the cost of pineapple is at the grocery store. We have deep and profound connections. So I'm very grateful for that. You know, I, one of the things I mentioned in my book is this experience introduced me to a group of people the world would call trauma survivors. And these are some of the most gracious, remarkable, profound, spiritually deep people walking this earth. But they're also people who have trauma that never recover from it. Yeah, but we froze. And they are the ones who become permits. After my husband's suicide, two people in particular reached out to me and were a lifeline. And they said, my spouse killed themselves. I understand a bit of what you're going through and you will survive this. So did I sign up for this? I hope not, but I might have. So I don't really have an answer. No, I understand. It's, 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 a, it's a really brutal life lesson if it was, you know what I mean? But I don't, I don't know what to think because, you know, like I just had someone in my family die of cancer, you know, and, and it was, it was very like rough and like, they didn't have a, an NDE. They didn't have a shared death experience. They didn't, you know, they, you know, they didn't have a deathbed. The one thing they did see was at the end, they, 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 it seemed like people were coming for them because it, it was my own boyfriend who died. And uh, he was like, like, like reaching out, like he was seeing people. Like I, 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 I was, I thought it was uh pretty weird um but i, I want to get you to get to get into your um your near-death experience if you could if you could tell the audience about what happened to you and and then the the miracle that happened afterwards yeah well but well, well, um hmm, simply <laughs> uh i did have a good life with my husband every morning in my life i woke up and really thank god that i had found him that i had stability that i had a routine we lived in a beautiful home in a beautiful place um, I traveled to Boston on a Monday morning, and shortly after my plane landed in Boston, he called me, and there was a terrible argument, and to be blunt, it was an argument he initiated, and we said things that people probably shouldn't say, and it just seemed to get worse and worse, and, and then he hung up and he did this thing, and I've learned since that that's not terribly uncommon. It's almost like they need that last bit, bit of um, push to do this horrible thing, and then about an hour later, I got the call that he'd been found. Uh, because I was out of town, somebody was going to the house to let my dog out. So about an hour later, I found out what had happened. And then I had to fly back immediately, which was very hard. <sighs> hard is an understatement. I mean, I had just gotten to my, I was actually visiting a child. I had just gotten to her house and I had to turn around and go back to Logan International Airport. And yet one of the things that happened, I got from Boston to Baltimore, and in Baltimore, there were no flights trying to get to where I was heading. And a Southwest agent came from behind the counter and sat with me on a bench out by the, the big window and said, you know, we're going to help you. We're going to help you get home. We're going to help you figure this out. And literally just sat with me while they tried to sort out. And they found a flight uh, that had one seat left heading to where I needed to be. And I, uh, he gave me a boarding pass and he said, please hurry. They are holding the plane for you. So I ran at breakneck speed down the, uh, down the long corridors to get to the gate. And as I got there, the, uh, gate attendant just said, are you Mrs. Thornton? I said, yes. And she said, keep running. And she grabbed my boarding pass. I ran on down the gateway. As soon as I crossed over the threshold, they, uh, they shut the, um, the door behind me to the hatch behind me into the plane. Well, I guess he was about kind of rough looking. He had on a uh, a T-shirt, a black sleeveless vest, uh, leather vest, and he had lots of tattoos and very interesting looking individual. And I was seated next to him and I was just staring straight ahead trying to figure out what do I do? My husband's dead. And not only is he dead, but in this horrible manner. And this guy sitting next to me asked, which was very gracious, he said, are you OK? And I said, not really. And he said, what's going on? And I told him, I just found out my husband killed himself and the argument and all this. And he said, I want you to remember, 
as you heal from this, that the angels are watching over you right now, that they are with you and they care about you. And he said, my mother started an argument with me, not unlike you described, said some terrible things. And after she hung up, uh, she used a gun to end her life. He said, so I understand something of what you're going through. And he said, he then explained in some detail how I would heal and it would be a process. He said, you know, there'll be a day where you go 15 minutes without thinking about this and a day where you make it to maybe a couple of hours. And he described this on and on in some detail. He talked to me for that entire flight. It was a short hop, but he talked to me and he was so loving and so kind and so good. So I realized that, and I, I have remembered that ever since, despite the level of trauma and shock and everything else, that the angels were watching over me. And how, how in the world on a 737-700 going south on a absolutely packed plane did I end up seated next to a fellow who had been through such a similar experience? And, offer, and then more than that, but he was able to comfort me and console me and help me. And so that was that was quite a thing. You know, part of my angst with my husband was I felt like I had failed God. My husband was an agnostic, and I was uh, a devout believer, a Christian, and I felt I had failed God, that it had been my job to show him that, one, life goes on, and two, there is a creator, and that our universe was a creation. And where do you go when you feel like you not only failed yourself, you not only failed your family, but you failed God? Because I felt like somehow if I could have done things differently, Perhaps he would have made different choices. So that's why the near-death experience, as we call it, was such a big deal. was because it was a reset. I was released from all that guilt and self-recrimination and self-condemnation and the horror of all of it. But in my experience, what happened, I had a cervical biopsy. 29 months after his death, there were you know, doctor appointments and a decision made to do a cervical biopsy to figure out how far this cancer had spread. And so I was... Uh, it cut out. You cut out. Are you still there? Um, we're, we're recording again. Um, you started with your NDE. You were saying it was a cervical biopsy. Right. Yeah, I went to a hospital for a cervical biopsy. The point was to determine how far the cancer had spread. Uh, because, you know, cancer is a big deal and had been actually diagnosed by a couple doctors. And in fact, upon examination, the doctor said he could tell by visual exam it had spread far enough that the flesh was distorted, which terrified me. You know, I really felt like, God, I've been through enough. Are we really doing this? So I was, I was out of my mind. I had never really understood how devastating a diagnosis of something like this could be. I mean, I already had PTSD and a myriad of other issues in terms of my mental health. So um, they did the cervical biopsy. They put me out in recovery. And uh, I once I was in recovery, they said, okay, up, 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 you go, out of bed. And I went off to the bathroom per their instructions, and I was bleeding profusely. Two more times, I told the RN that was attending me that I was bleeding profusely, and I was very concerned. And she said, oh, why don't you get home and lay down? You'll feel just fine, which was not a good thing to say and also not accurate. But I had never... I had pretty much no experience with the medical world. I was on no prescription but drugs. When I had a problem, I prayed and had resolution. So this whole thing of an interchange with the medical world was very new for me. So I went home. I did as instructor, went home. By the time I got home, I realized I was still bleeding profusely, a lot, a lot of blood. I have pretty white wall-to-wall -wall carpet in my house, and I didn't want to mess up the carpet. So I went and I stood in my walk-in shower so I could bleed and not worry about making a mess. And Standing in that shower, I thought about my prayer that I said, God, heal me or let me go. And I realized maybe this is my way out, that I'm obviously bleeding to death. And I seriously thought about sitting down on the floor of that shower and letting this be the end. And I realized uh, I, early on, somebody had read me a Bible verse. It was 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It said, God will show you a way out. I thought maybe this is it. Maybe this is God's mercy. All I have to do is sit down. I'll continue to bleed. It won't be long because I had lost so much blood. It's pretty amazing how much blood the human body has and how, how fast it can come out. And as I thought about that, I thought about my two friends on the other side of that wall in my living room who brought me home from the hospital and had been so attentive. In fact, one of those friends had lived with me for um, about 24 months. After my husband's death, I was unable to care for myself. So this man was not just a friend, but a living caregiver. And he also helped with the bills. We split the rent on a small rental house. 
So I thought, you know, all this energy and effort that's been put into keeping me alive, is it really fair for me to sit down on the shower floor and let them come in and find me in a bit, splayed on the floor, dead, messy? So I thought about it. Oh, well, shoot, I guess it's not. So I stepped out of the shower, put a few towels around myself, stepped out in the living room, said, call 911. I'm bleeding to death. And they did. Ambulance took me to a little ER, a standalone ER, not connected to a hospital, not physically connected to a hospital. More mistakes were made there. They were dismissive. They didn't believe I was really bleeding to death. And then they, uh, they, like I said, more mistakes were made. One of them was they gave me a shot of Dilaudid, which is a morphine derivative and also can cause your blood pressure to go down. So oh. that was not a good choice. Yeah. And then, uh, the nurse and the doctor, actually the nurse had been by my side while they administered this, prepared to administer this injection of Dilaudid. And uh, I grabbed that nurse's hand and I said, promise me, you're not going to let me die. Because at this point, you know, I'm, I'm in. And I was frightened. It is frightened. Even though you think you're ready to die, it's so frightening when you see your, your blood pouring out of your body. And she held my hand and even wiped a few tears from the side of my face and said, oh, honey, we have many solutions for this one. You're not going to die. And I thought, okay, I believe her. She seems pretty capable, pretty confident. And then, uh, unfortunately, the nurse and the doctor stepped out of the room and left me alone. Again, my friend was with me sitting at the side of the bed. My friend, I use the name Effie in the book to protect his privacy. But he was, uh, he was right there with me. And he said, I lost consciousness pretty fast. And he noticed at the one point he looked at the blood pressure machine, which they had left hooked up to me. And it said 32 over 25. Which is pretty wow, that's low. Pretty much popped open, and he said, "You you tried to sit up on the gurney, which is pretty impressive for somebody with a blood pressure of thirty two over twenty five." And he said, "You looked, um, you you tried to sit up, but you couldn't. So you reached up, put your hands right above your head, reached up high toward the ceiling, talked to somebody. Only you could see," he said, and uh, and then he said, "Your arms flopped back to your side." And then your blood pressure went to error, which meant it was lower than 32 over 25. And he said um, that's when he ran to get the nurse and the nurse was on her way because now the alarms and buzzers and things were going off. But meanwhile, I was having the time of my life. Uh, I, I awakened from this in, in this new experience. I, the best I can describe being knocked out between the blood loss and the blotted it was a deep dreamless state. I wasn't dreaming. It was just a very deep, unconscious, dreamless state. And I woke up being catapulted out of my body. And I mean catapulted. And I knew I had not a minute's doubt what was happening. And I was in a blackness, a velvety, comforting, comfortable, and actively, actively comforting. Comfort is a verb, blackness. I heard another person describe it as velvet. It was like just being in black velvet. It wasn't cold or hot not damp or, or dry. It was perfect, absolutely perfect. And I was floating further and further away from my body in this blackness. And it was so peaceful. And I, the first words in this new experience were, my heart has stopped. And I thought, how do I know that? I thought, I don't know how I know that, but I know that's right. My heart has stopped. And the thing was, I have lived alone subsequent to my husband's death. Well. I live in my head a lot. And so I always talk out loud. And I was talking out loud in this experience. And several people said, oh, it was telepathy. You thought you were talking. No, I was talking. I knew I was talking more than I know I'm talking right now. And I observed. I said, I don't have breath sounds. I don't, I don't think I have vocal like? cords. Did you have a body? I, I don't. Yeah, I did. And I don't, I don't, I wasn't paying attention to that. But I was cognizant of the fact that I had, you're like, I had oh, a head. Right? I had you're shoulders. Like yeah, I was floating. In fact, if, if you told me my body went with me, I, I guess I would have believed. I don't know. I mean, I had an awareness of having a head and shoulders and arms and legs. And I, but the thing is, I wasn't paying attention to that. That was really not on my radar. But as I'm floating away from this, I hear myself talking. I'm talking. I sound just like I sound now, which I thought was really cool. And then after this recognition that my heart had stopped, my next words were, you're dying. And then I thought, actually, you're not dying. You're dead. Because being a writer, you have to get the tense right. And then I thought, that's pretty funny. And I, I laughed out loud. And I heard myself giggle. And I thought, wow, I sound like I've always sounded. And it really it was really impressing me very deeply that nothing had changed. 
you know, we hear some of the, I guess the Eastern philosophies will tell you there is no death. And I was appreciating that there is no death. The only thing, and, and the, the transition was so incredibly simplistic. It was literally like moving from one room to the next. It wasn't this big, you know, going to another dis- dimension or another sphere or death, or it was nothing big. It was literally slipping from here to there. I, I mean, it is more difficult to go from a bedroom to an adjoining bedroom than it was for me to go from this earth experience to wherever I was. It was so fast and seamless. So yes, I was floating away from my body and I, I said this thing I thought was so funny and cracked myself up and I heard my giggle. And when I heard myself giggle, something very profound I realized was what did I leave behind on that gurney? I have my sense of humor. I have my memories. My memories were very intact. In fact, one of the thoughts I had very early on was I had struggled mightily with suicidal ideations. I had been very tempted to take my own life because of the pain and the grief and the sadness occasioned by his death. So I've been very tempted in my own life. And in this experience, I thought, hey, I got away clean. I did this. It's, it's, I didn't do this to myself, but I'm dead. It's over. Yay. I really felt like, and I've said this on other podcasts, I felt very much like I had been granted early release for good behavior. It was over. And I'm so grateful. Just so grateful. I cannot emphasize enough how grateful I felt that this earth experience was completely over. So floating, floating away in this blackness, a lot of things happened. But one of them was... I was joined by a massive spiritual being and he, she was taller than me, slightly behind me and to my left. And I remember turning my head and looking up and I'm in this blackness. I can't see anything, but I said, literally one, I was pretty impressed by the fact that I am looking over my left shoulder. I'm turning my head to look over my left shoulder. So I had something approximating a human-esque form there. And so I look up over my left shoulder and I said, and who are you? And I, you know, I was pretty happy. Now I had somebody with me. And the answer was, you, Rosemary, you are the image and likeness. I'm the original. And I immediately recognized that as Genesis 1, 26 and 27, that we're made in the image and likeness of God. And I thought to myself, I spent my whole life studying that Bible verse. I've always wondered what it really meant to be made in the image and likeness of God. And it came not with just words, but with an infusion of knowledge. And I thought about the Bible verse in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Words have tremendous power. And these words have had even more power because they came with this powerful infusion of knowing. And I understood it. I understood that there's an original and I'm the image and likeness of that original. And I remember thinking, again, kind of goofy, but I remember thinking, that would have been good to know back there. You know, we're on a new plane. It's okay. Still good information to have. <laughs> and because I knew, I knew I wasn't going back. In fact, the, honestly, the thought of going back literally never crossed my consciousness, never even entered into the picture, none whatsoever. I was just so grateful that this was over. And, you know, a really interesting thing, uh, you know, when somebody passes on and they're trying to resuscitate them, they'll call the person's name again and again and again. I could hear somebody screaming Rosemary over and over and over again. And I was not Rosemary. And I, it, it was not, I didn't hear Rosemary. I mean, I could hear they were saying it, but it was almost like the annoying buzz of an alarm clock. Then you hear this sound, this rah, 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 and I could hear the sound. But, you know, if somebody calls your name in a crowd, you can't help but whip your head around and see who's saying it. And it felt like the sound was behind me some distance. And yet it kept getting softer and softer and softer and softer the more this experience went on. So uh, in this place, I wasn't Rosemary. I wasn't mother. I wasn't author. I wasn't friend. I was just a child of God going home. And that was just so clear to me. You know, there's an old song. Uh, going home, going home, I'm just going home. And and I knew that's what was happening. I was just going home. And it was so familiar. And the people, the spiritual beings that were with me, they knew me. I, it was just so familiar. They knew me. They'd always known me. They'd always liked me. They always loved me. And I just, I love this experience so much. And And I even thought about a Bible verse, the peace that passeth all understanding, which is what Paul talked about. And I thought, this is that peace. I have perfect peace. And a lot of people talk about when they have an NDE, they talk about the love. I felt peace. It was like the most perfect peace you could ever imagine. And I remember thinking, I've always wondered what Rosemary, the writer, the neurotic writer, would look like 
without any anxiety or fear or worries or woes. And I thought, this is pretty neat. This is what I look like. And when I was thinking about what exactly did I leave behind on that earthly experience, I thought all the negative stuff, you know, all the good stuff, all that I really am came with me. What got left behind was um, just the bad stuff, just the not good stuff. At some point, uh, I was no longer floating and I was on my feet in a white room and I swear I've as best I've I've tried I can't remember the transition from that white room or from the black to the white room and it it really feels like somebody took my batteries out I don't know what happened there but I don't remember but next thing I know I'm, I'm on I'm in this white room standing on something approximating legs and feet and I remember thinking I so clearly remember this I don't know if I have legs or feet but I see a door on the other side of this room, and I know what that door is after a lifetime of reading NDEs. And I mean, I've read George Ritchie and Daniel Brinkley and Betty Eady and uh, all of them. I have read all Moody, books. Yeah. Even, yeah, I read Raymond, Raymond Moody's book too many times to count in the 70s. I knew that door meant that that was, that was the point of no return. I couldn't wait to get to that door. And I pretty much said to the, you know, whomever was with me or whoever was with me in that room, I pretty much said, okay, make a pass out of my way. I'm doing the door. We're not going to discuss this. I, I know I want the door. And uh, I remember thinking, I don't know if I have legs or feet, but I know I can move with intention and I will perambulate toward that, that door. And so I endeavored to do that. And in this white room, there was a mist falling and it was a very heavy mist. And yet it wasn't cool or damp as you might expect a vapor or a mist to be or a fog, I guess. And the the mist was swirling around me. It was all around me. And it's very powerful. And yet through this mist, I could see that door. And so I'm trying to, to move as quickly as I can through these 15 to 20 feet to get to that door I see on the other side of the room. And I remember trying to focus on one of the individual droplets in that mist. And I know that sounds kind of nuts, but I asked the angel, there was a spiritual being with me. I said, why can't I focus on one of the droplets? And the angel said, uh, your your eyes have not acclimated to this new environment yet, but those droplets are particles of light, and that's what's swirling around you. And it was explained to me before we go to heaven that these heavy beliefs of earth, these the, the muck of earth actually is what I was told, has to be cleansed from us. And some people die with amputations or limitations of vision or deafness or a disease process so heavily imprinted on their soul they think it's part of their natural, their their divine nature. And this was like in, kind of like a spiritual car wash. As a friend said, leave your muddy boots at the door. We can't go into heaven with all this gunk and muck cling, clinging to us. So it was, um, it was quite something, that white mist. So uh, as I got closer to the door, I don't really remember the timing of this because time is very linear. And heaven is very non-linear in terms of time. But it, I, it was explained to me that if I agreed to go back, that I would be restored to wholeness. And I, I remember thinking, I'm nothing, nothing to talk me into going back. I have the most perfect peace I've ever known. I've never known peace. I've had, you know, a, a, as we said earlier, I've had kind of a difficult life. And I've never known this kind of peace. And to be free of all the worries of the world was so powerful so uh i came to that door and i uh i paused and i said is this the divine will for my life which i kind of think back to that moment and i think well, should i really have asked that but when you're in that place all you want to do is glorify god and that was my I, I can't stress that enough you're suddenly you're not living for yourself you want to honor and glorify god and the answer was no this is not the divine will for your life that you die from a medical mistake but whatever you decide if you decide to go forward or you decide to go back to earth you go with all of god's blessings and mercy and grace and love and care and i thought i'll take that deal and i put my right hand up to push through that door because and i thought again pretty cool right handed on earth right handed in heaven i thought gee that's pretty neat and as i was doing that i had had a vision of that RN who had shown me so much kindness and the RN was sitting in a hospital supply room surrounded by linens and, and other medical supplies. And she was sitting on a little metal stool, leaning forward, head in her hands, sobbing uncontrollably. And in this vision, I saw her say through tears, 
I promised that woman I wasn't going to let her die. And I lost her. I was like, oh, man, come on. And then I thought, you know what? She's an RN. She's been doing this a while. She'll get over this. <laughs> and then. <laughs> but, no, because it, you end, I know what you end up choosing, obviously, because you're back here. But what I was going to say is like, you know, like, do you think that's what it's about? That God wants us to show mercy towards other people and be ultimately more kind than we would ever think of. You had all the, you had all the chips in your corner on, you know, like you had all the, the aces in your, your hand, hand of cards and you could have walked through that door easily, but you chose to come back to, I mean, also, well, and also, no. did you think that maybe God wanted you to come back? So, he, you can show that there is an afterlife that you can be another proof of that there so maybe people will change their ways if they see this video or another podcast you're in so two questions there but yes well and what happened i decided you know she was an rn and she signed up for this and she'd be fine and honestly i do remember very clearly thinking i need to go i cannot return to this life experience because it's been such a mess i mean i had a body with cancer i had all this depression, all these problems, so many problems. But um, after this, it wasn't just the vision, I felt her pain. Suddenly I was feeling, co-experiencing the grief and the regret and the pain. And I recognized it. I recognized that powerful grief is the feelings I had been dealing with for 29 months subsequent to my husband's suicide. So that is when I recognized if I can spare one person that much grief, I have to go back. And boy, was I disappointed. I cannot begin to describe how disappointed I was. But I did. I put my right hand down by my side. And I said, my last words in heaven were, it's going to ruin that nurse's day. I die. And lots and lots of activity going on all around me. To answer your question, why I came back, uh, I don't know. I don't have an easy answer. Um, I, I don't have an easy answer. And, and subsequent to this, it took some time and it took some effort. But uh, I had to find another oncologist. Turns out when you go back to your original oncologist and say, and say listen, I, I'm not going to be needing that once a week chemo or that five times a week radiation because I was healed in heaven. They're not always on board. They're not always cheerleading. Yay, healed in heaven. <laughs> what they say is, uh, listen, you're doing the chemo. You know, we caught this early enough. There's a 70% chance the first round of chemo will be effective. We are doing this. We're going forward. And I had to find another oncologist, and that was not easy. And I had to find one about an hour in a different direction because the first one was very adamant that my chemo begin as soon as I was recovered from bleeding to death. But, um, you know, backing up a little bit, the, the first day in the hospital, because I was taken to a trauma center at this point. Once they got me back, man, they, then they moved fast. But I was taken to a trauma center. I was put in a hospital for several days. And the next morning, a doctor came into the room to see me. And he explained to me, he said, um, Mrs. Thornton, you've had a heart attack. And I said, not me. I eat my veggies. I eat my fruits. I bike. I, I exercise. I'm in good shape. And he said, no, no, you had a heart attack. And he said, you lost so much blood last night, your heart stopped. And apparently, as the heart muscle is dying, it throws off enzymes. And so they believed there was significant heart damage. So I was taken away for an echocardiogram. And when I came back from that, they said, Mrs. Thornton, you're very lucky. There's no damage to your heart. And the whole ride down, you know, the whole way down, they, they wheel your little bed down the hallway to take it for an echocardiogram in the hospital. The whole way down, I was saying, we don't need to do this. I was, I'm fine. The angel said, if I agreed to come back, I'd be fine, fine, fine. And, you know, they did an awful lot of tests. And ultimately, they did find that I was extremely healthy. <laughs> that There were no consequences. It was really interesting. There's a lot of interesting things. But I was gone for more than 10 minutes. And the thing about this is when somebody dies from bleeding to death, you cannot perform CPR because all that will do is push more blood out. So for more than 10 minutes, there was no oxygenation to my brain. So the odds of somebody coming back from this with absolutely no brain damage are pretty darn tiny. So that's one evidence of it being more than the brain shutting down. The other thing is it took, as I said, it took a couple months to find another oncologist and have a second surgical biopsy. And boy, oh boy, was that a thorough, that was a whole different thing the second time. She took a lot of flesh from a lot of places. But again, my friend was waiting for me outside in the waiting room. And he said she burst through those doors. The surgeon threw her arms around his neck and said, she's right. There is not one cell of cancer in her, you know, to be found. In fact, what she said, and I thought this was a great PS. She said, in fact, her flesh is so pink and pretty and perfect. I don't believe she ever had cancer. So it was a very profound healing. The other thing is the grief was gone. 
I felt liberated. I felt absolutely unshackled from that horrible story. I felt like, I really felt like a parent, a heavenly parent, had shaken me awake from a terrible nightmare and said, it's over. It was just a really bad nightmare, but it's over. And it's no part of your story. And in time, I realized it was not even part of my husband's story. And it was all, you know, I, I wrote a book about it. It's 200 and I think 240 some pages because there's a lot to this that can't really be un revealed in an hour's time. But I mean, when my friends, I was in the hospital for several days and I had, again, a couple friends who stayed right with me in the hospital. And sometimes they'd leave to go get a bite to eat or for whatever reason. When those people left me and I was on total bed rest in the hospital, um, the angels would come to my bedside and sing to me. And oh, we cut out. And they would sing, okay, your humans aren't here. Oh, dear. Where do we cut out? We're good. We're good. We're, we're good. You said the angels were uh, singing to you? Yes. When my humans exited the room, the angels came in. The angels appeared at the bedside and sang me the most beautiful songs. And I cannot describe how much comfort that provided. In fact, I told the angels, I said, uh, I'm really good with houses. That's my background. background. I'm an architectural historian. And I told the angels, I'm really good with houses, but not so much songs and melodies and lyrics. I said, I won't be able to remember this. And they said, this isn't for you to remember. This is for your healing and your peace and your joy. And they said, we know how hard it is to come back after seeing heaven. So this is our thank you for coming back. Uh, it was a very powerful experience to have angels surround my bedside and sing me and uh, sing to me. And the songs they sung were songs of, of praise and glorifying God. It was quite something. Wow, that's an amazing story. That's amazing. And I believe every every word, you know, I think it was obviously, I think you had a very real experience. I, I think these near-death experiences are like, see, I'm going to get your last opinion on this. Like the people say that the chemicals are released in the brain, like the DMT, you know, um, that our, our body releases DMT. But you felt this was very real, right? Like you could tell that you were in another dimension. You were in heaven or what we would call heaven. It was a, you, 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 this was like very verifiable, right? I mean, like, I just want to get like your opinion on that as compared to someone saying, oh, chemicals and all that stuff. The thing about the argument with chemicals, one, you know, that's been disproven. That's kind of an older theory that they have now established is, is not explainable, is not accurate. Secondly, when I died, I had cancer to a point that my flesh on the inside of my body was distorted. When I came back, this second uh, gynecological oncologist took flesh samples, or I guess sa samples from so many places and parts in my body. And this was done, it was a three hour surgery. That was also done under general anesthesia. Not one cell of cancer was found. And that that's was her me. comment that the flesh was so perfect that there was no evidence. The thing is, that's not just somebody having a brain shutting down from lack of oxygen. And secondly, if somebody it, it's believed that after six minutes where the brain has no supply of oxygen, there is irreversible brain death. There's no yeah. coming back from that. 10 minutes is a long time. And, and CPR could not be performed because I had a hole somewhere. I had something bleeding, which is how this all came to be. And I do have a medically documented proof that my heart stopped. And it's, that's the thing. If, if somebody dies and comes back, I guess the non-believers can say, well, you know, it's just the brain shutting down. But I died with cancer and I came back without it. That's how a, do you explain that as it's amazing. that's a pretty darn good proof? There's, there's nowhere, there's no really words to say, but it's an amazing story. It really is. I, I truly think you were brought back to tell this story so that people become more believers in the afterlife and like, and, and maybe change the way they, they are about, you're one of the many, I think, of, you know, that I think there's people who, I think we're in the time of a great awakening and people are doing, things are happening to people in all different kinds of ways. There's people are having near death experiences, out of body experiences. <laughs> ET contact, all kinds of different things to show us we're a lot more than what we think. And we haven't been correctly taught about the way life really is. And I think you're a living example of that, that 
there's something else as when we pass on. There's a lot of something else. I I have uh, you know my stories appear in a lot of places and it's on some YouTube channels and podcasts and such. But I had a woman from two states away drive over to where I was living in the Midwest to see me, and she was a she is a neuroscientist. And she said to her, the most remarkable part of my story was that after this, when I was out of the hospital, I changed every single facet of my life. I sold off all my earthly belongings. I sold my brand new car back to the dealership. I sold my house. And then I moved a thousand miles away west to start a new life. She said that was the most remarkable part of my story to her because she said based on her studies, her research, Human minds don't change that fast. Human beings don't make that much change that fast. I completely changed everything about my life. And she said, that to me is proof enough that this is legit. And the thing is, I sold, I did sell off, sell off all of my earthly belongings, furniture, all of it. And uh, I haven't missed it. That's what's so interesting. There's never been a day, so, oh, I wish I still had that bed. I wish I'd kept my mom's antique dressers. I wish I still had that couch. None of it. I'm so grateful to be shed of that. And I realized my life has not been simple or easy. And I realized the happiest I had ever known was the time I was floating away from my body and in that white room. And in those experiences, floating away from my body and in that white room, I had nothing. I had absolutely nothing. And yet it was the most perfect joy I've ever experienced. And I thought, then joy come. The joy cannot possibly come from things. Joy comes from God. And I, uh, the Bible talks, uh, Revelations talks about the river of light that flows from the throne of God. And I mean, every day I, tr I try to see myself immersed in that river of light. And, you know, another thing that happened that was life changing. I went to a church service at a small church on the East Coast soon after I was out of the hospital. And it was a uh, piano, a baby grand at the front of the church. And when the pianist struck the chords to begin the prelude for the service, I saw an explosion of color burst from the keys of that piano and the explosion of color and lights went up, up and up and up to the ceiling and it hit the ceiling of this church and spread out across the ceiling and it almost looked like uh, the arcs created by welding metal and the, but it was color. It wasn't just the yellow, it was color and these little sparkles of light spread out across the whole ceiling and then it dripped down on the congregants sitting in the pews. And it was so beautiful. And I, I had never seen anything like it. And I was kind of looking around like, does anyone else see this? And it was so overwhelming. I, I began to sob. I'm sitting on a pew and listening to a prelude in a small church. And I began to sob because I was so overwhelmed by the unbelievable beauty of this, seeing this. And one of the congregants stepped out of her pew and sat next to me and said, you know, dear, are you okay? And I said, yes. And I, I have literally begged and pleaded to see that again. And I only saw it that one time. And yet, conversely, I have never heard a keyed instrument like a piano or an organ play without remembering that. I haven't seen it again, but I've never forgotten that. So we are living, we are living in a world of spirit and light and love. And we have to open our eyes to see it. But that's, the whole thing was so transformative to me. And now when I see Part of the reason I was able to sell everything off is all I wanted to see was God's beauty. I, I wanted to see corn growing. People laugh at that. I wanted to see trees swaying in the wind. I, I wanted to just see nature's beauty. I wanted to see the colors of spring, even the grays of fall. I, it just all was so beautiful. And the colors of nature just suddenly were so powerful to me. And that's all I wanted. I didn't need the stuff man makes. I just wanted to see beauty. And it's, so I, I still look for it. And I struggle and strive very hard every day to hear the angels. I, I want to hear them all the time. And they faded. And I'm a little angry that they faded because I want to hear them forever. I just want to hear the angels for all time. And I think you, you've asked why I came back. Maybe it was to write a book. I don't know. Maybe it's to share the story. My story has been heard by 11 million people now, which is a lot of people. I hope it inspires and gives faith. But do I have any doubt that life goes on? Zero. Absolutely zero. In fact, I was talking with somebody else and I said, when I see a hearse go by, you know, you're in traffic and you see everyone pulls out and a hearse goes by. I look at that hearse and I think, frankly, what I think is you lucky bastard. I know where you are. I know what you're experiencing, you know. And, yeah. and when I see any, I hear about somebody who's died, I just think, wow, they went home. They just slipped from here to there. 
they've gone home and and they're with people that know them and love them and that's the thing when i was in that blackness floating further and fur, further away from my body i said i felt such familiarity i was with my real family and and i don't mean to diminish fam earth family but i was with people with whom i've had spiritual connections i guess for all time i don't know but i just felt so familiar they knew me and i knew them you, and i just i didn't want to leave that and do you think you knew them from past lives do you think you've had past lives as well i don't i frankly i personally do not believe in reincarnation and i sure as i sure as heck don't think we come back to earth i mean my gosh what is it we have billions of galaxies wasn't that the famous carl sagan quote we have billions and billions of galaxies what kind of creator would put us back on this third dirt ball from the sun when there are billions of galaxies so i i don't buy into the past lives because the other thing is you know so i'm so tired of hearing karma something more than once i've been told oh you did something very bad in a prior life and that's why in this life your husband shot himself in the head and you went through all this horror it's you have bad karma no karma is just another form of self-righteousness certainly the way it's explained in amongst you know popular folks here it's people want to insulate themselves from trauma so they make up a story they tell themselves and unfortunately share with a trauma victim as to why something like this will never happen to them so they make up a story and they say well this won't happen to me because i met a man whose child died at age well she was a teenager and he said people would say well you know if you hadn't used this remedy she probably would have lived they're not saying that to comfort him they're saying that to comfort themselves because when trauma happens people like to think well that's not going to happen to me because fill in the blank i did this i did that i didn't do this i didn't do that it's very 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 unfair so i'm i'm not into reincarnation i believe i do believe life is eternal i believe we were someplace before and i believe we'll be someplace again but as this idea of just recycling through the human experience on earth again and again sounds like hell you know, it just sounds like hell, and maybe that's what hell I, I, I is. I agree. But... Can I tell you, I'm a trauma victim too. I don't I, I want to talk. I don't talk about it on my podcast. Maybe sometime I'll tell you off air. But like, you know, I know what it's like to go through an extreme trauma. And there was like about six months of my life where I was like really wondering like whether like you know I should end my life or it was like life going to continue for me somewhere I didn't want it to because of some stupid thing that happened. And, and uh, you know, it made me reassess my whole life. And, you know, um, it was just like the most horrible time of my life. And I, I, I realized that this trauma, it happens to a lot more of us. It happens to a lot of people. I mean, there are those people that, that I know what you mean. There are those people that think that nothing bad can ever happen to them. And, and I think they're just fooling themselves because I think it, it can happen to anybody. If it happened to me, it happened to you. I think it happens to a lot of us. You know what I mean? It's just some, some people, they don't want to talk about their traumas. You know what I mean? Whether they were, you know, like raped when they were a kid or something or, you know, something horrible. They had abusive parents or, you know, um, they or they had to deal with poverty, extreme poverty or 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 you know whatever it just seems like this earth is like i you're right i wouldn't want to come back i don't think i would want to come back i, I definitely would not want to come back it's not a, it's not a comfortable place even if i had there's an old african i was gonna say there's an old african-american spiritual that says this earth is not my home i'm just a passing through and that really says it all so yeah. why would we want to leave home again and again and again you know uh, gosh some great quote i can't remember who it is but um poets and essayists and sophists have always said there's really nothing as sweet as going home and i mean that's true of our physical home here on earth it's a million times more true about going to our real home yeah i agree that's it's pretty amazing well do you want to tell everybody your website and uh how they can find yes you? Yes, I can be reached through my website, which is temporarydeath.com. Uh, and again, I, I'm not a fan of the word near death. Uh, and then my book is Remembering the Light, How Dying Saved My Life. And it is it is in paperback. It was an ebook for a long time, but now it's in paperback. Um, and that book is at Amazon, of course, the world's greatest bookstore. But yeah, my website, you can contact me. There's a ch chapter one is up at the website if anyone wants to see if they like the book they can look at chapter one and my my goal in writing this book a lot of people uh, i did not want to write a book i've written nine nine's enough but i it was my hope that it could bring solace to people and comfort that life goes on it's just you know it's just one more story saying this thing happened and it's it's uh what's the word 
it, I have experiential proof that life goes on. This isn't some theory. This this is legit. And the amount of peace we feel in this next world, you, when you know what heaven is like, you'll never feel sorry for anyone who's passed on. You'll just, like I say, I think you lucky bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this has been amazing. I want to thank you for doing this. And uh, I'll send you a link when I post the episode, probably tomorrow. I'll probably just get it up tonight and post it tomorrow. That sounds great. Well, thank you. It was very nice meeting you. Thank you. You too. Have a good night. <laughs>